friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, and I once lost an arm wrestling match with a snake. Please don't ask. Today we're going to be diving into the wild world of reptile hunting techniques. Specifically, we'll be talking about the two coolest and deadliest methods in the animal kingdom, venom and constriction. These are the weapons of choice for many snakes, and each has its own set of incredible adaptations that make them effective hunters. So. Let's jump in and learn how these scaly predators bring home the bacon, or more accurately, the rodents, or birds, deer, alligators even. Snakes eat a lot of things. Reptiles are fascinating hunters, and they've evolved some truly extraordinary strategies to catch and subdue their prey. But the two we're talking about today might be the most impressive Obviously, that's why we're talking about them. <laughs> Venom, used by snakes like cobras or rattlesnakes, and hundreds of others, and constriction, favored by boas and pythons, and many colubrids, and again, many others. <laughs> Let's break these down and see what makes each one so effective. First up, venom. Nature's biochemical warfare. It's never a war crime the first time. Now, there are venomous reptiles that aren't snakes, but snakes are the ones who have perfected its use. And I mean, when you think of a venomous reptile, you think of a snake. Venom is produced by specialized glands, which is then delivered via hollowed fangs or grooved teeth. The venom itself is a complex cocktail of proteins and enzymes designed to incapacitate and sometimes digest their prey. It can be broadly categorized into three types. I'm not going to dig into too much detail about the ins and outs of the venom as I do that in this video here, but broadly, here's what we've got. Neurotoxic venom, which attacks the nervous system causing paralysis or respiratory failure. Black mambas are pros at packing a punch with this type of venom. Hematoxic venom, which targets the circulatory system, breaking down blood, cells, and tissues. Rattlesnakes use this as their go-to to goo when subduing prey. Cytotoxic venom. This is the melty stuff. Attacking cells and dissolving tissue with the help of a bunch of protolytic enzymes, which are found in all venom types, by the way, that are especially effective on muscle and blood vessel tissues. Basically, this stuff turns healthy living tissue into a necrotic goopy mess. Tagged by a cobra, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of this stuff. It's not gonna be fun. It's not usually that only one type of venom is exclusively found in this species or in that species situation either. Most species venoms will be a kind of mix of all three varieties of venom, just in different proportions. Rattlesnakes, for example, have a hematoxic venom, but there are neurotoxic and cytotoxic components to it as well. However, the hematoxic qualities are what's doing the lion's share of damage. Cobra venom is considered by many to be cytotoxic, but a case could be made to describe it as neurotoxic too, because there's just so much of that in the mix as well. And let's not forget the basic principle of toxicology. Decisis sola facit venenum. That sounds like a made up word. Who was made up? Now, you probably don't speak Latin like I, obviously and fluent in, but it, it does mean only the dose makes the poison. The venom of the black widow spider is up to 15 times more potent than that of a rattlesnake's, but I'd rather take a black widow bite. <laughs> to be clear, I do not want to be bitten by a black widow under any circumstances, but I'd rather one from one of them than a rattlesnake. Why? Well, because a Black Widow's yield, how much venom it is available to be injected, is so small that actual harm caused by a Black Widow, which is potentially a lot, don't get me wrong, is likely to be much smaller than that of a rattlesnake. The snake's venom might be less potent, but there is so much more of it being injected at once that it's just so much more devastating. Rattlesnake venom is far more potent than that of a king cobra's, but again, because cobras are able to dump such a massive amount of venom, they are far more deadly, even though their venom is weak tea, relatively speaking, of course. Again, I'll refer to you to this video here. I hope I'm pointing in the correct way. I cover all of this in detail with math and everything, even though I don't like math, so you should really go look at that video. 
Please don't make my math for nothing. Venom toxicity and dosage can be a powerful tool, but it's more than just stopping prey in its tracks. As mentioned earlier, it also starts breaking down tissue from the inside, making it easier for the predator to digest. And in some cases, the smell of the venom breaking down tissue can be tracked, making it easier for the snake to just tag the prey, dump in some deadly juice, and have the now basted victim scamper off and wait for the venom to do its thing and then just leisurely follow the unique scent trail to a conveniently dead or paralyzed meal. The hunter avoids having to expend much energy chasing or wrestling their prey, or even digesting it, as the process is started before the prey is even swallowed. Efficient and deadly. Gotta love it. Unless you're the prey. They probably don't like it all that much. Well, now let's switch gears and talk about constriction, the very last hug many animals will ever get. Kind of morbid, but yeah. Unlike venom, constriction is all about brute force, with constrictors like boas and pythons using their powerful bodies to subdue their prey. Here's how it works. The snake either goes out and finds the prey, or waits in ambush for prey to get close enough, then strikes with blistering speed and grabs a hold of the prey with its teeth. The snake will then throw its muscular body around the victim in looping coils. Once coiled properly, it's pretty much over from there. The snake will tighten up, putting tremendous pressure on the prey, rendering it unconscious almost instantly, with death following very shortly after. You might see information online or hear knowledgeable folks talking about how constrictors kill by crushing their prey, or even tightening with each breath, limiting the air that the prey can take in, causing death by relatively slow asphyxiation. Each time the springbok exhales, the python squeezes tighter. No, it doesn't. Every breath becomes shallower as the python tightens its grip. No! until death by strangulation. That is not how it works. You shouldn't need an 18 year old on YouTube to fact check you. You're National Geographic. It doesn't strangle. And strangulation is up here. It's not all down here. No. But contrary to popular belief, constrictors don't actually do either of those things. Sure, some crushing can occur, and there are certainly instances where due to some quirk in circumstances, the prey does end up dying by asphyxiation. But those are usually the outliers. The way it's supposed to work is that constriction attacks the blood, not the air. Death comes from overwhelming the circulatory system. The snake squeezes so hard that the heart cannot move blood around against the pressure. Without fresh oxygenated blood going through the brain, unconsciousness occurs in seconds, and death a little after that. The heart may try to keep beating for several minutes, and there may be uh, the appearance of some struggling for a while, but it's mostly reflexive movement, not a concentrated attempt to defend. It's pretty much game over as soon as the squeeze is on. In rare cases where the prey does actually manage to escape after being properly squeezed, they're still likely to not be out of the woods. <laughs> the trauma of the squeeze is so intense that it causes hyperkalemia. Massive amounts of potassium are suddenly dumped into the bloodstream potentially more than double the normal amount, effectively making the prey's blood acidic and toxic to itself. This often results in a potassium-induced cardiac arrest within minutes of getting away. When properly executed, as is the overwhelming majority of the time, it's a quick and effective method, though it does require a lot more physical exertion than venom. If you're wondering on how on earth a constrictor can squeeze so hard for so long and still be able to breathe itself, check out this video here. It goes into all of that as well as some of the absolutely crazy things that happen to snakes when digesting enormous meals. Wild stuff. Just unnecessarily strange. You ever see pictures, probably out of Florida, Florida. where you see a giant big python with a great big alligator that has just busted out from within it? Both are dead. How does that happen? So was the gator just too big of a meal? Maybe. Who am I to judge? Probably not. 
It's most likely due to a miscalculation of the snake. You see, gators are cold-blooded, as you probably know. They have a slower, much more efficient metabolism. As such, they need less of everything that a warm-blooded animal like you or I do, including oxygen. Plus, they're really, really tough. When oxygenated blood is cut off from a gator, it takes a lot longer for them to be rendered unconscious compared to a similarly sized warm-blooded animal. Once unconscious, it takes even longer for them to actually pass as well. This means that the snake in these cases most likely just didn't hold on and squeeze for long enough before swallowing their gator. So said gator, who is only mostly dead, or, you know, actually dead, but didn't really know it yet, wakes up inside the snake and starts to struggle, often tearing open the snake in the process. The gator may be able to work their way out before suffocating inside of the snake or succumbing to that potassium induced heart attack I mentioned earlier, and the gator still ends up dying. You know, when you were little and your parents this, I know sounds strange, just keep with it, kept harping on you to chew your food properly before swallowing. Well, the snake parent version of that should be constrict your food properly before swallowing. Yeah? No? Maybe. Yeah, but I have nothing else. <laughs> okay. I was gonna try and come up with more on the spot. This is riffing? It, no. Okay. Boas and pythons seem to be who folks think about when thinking of constricting snakes and I get it. That's kind of like their shtick, right? The biggest and most physically impressive snakes in the whole world are constrictors. No wonder that is front of mind. I mean, arguably the most iconic snake is the boa constrictor. I mean, it's right there in the name too. And it's in the scientific name, not just the regular name. But as impressive as boas and pythons are in this arena, we shouldn't be sleeping on colubrids who use this method too. Common pet snake species like corn snakes, rat snakes, capable constrictors in their own right, but nowhere near as powerful as pythons or boas. But then you have the king snake. Beautiful snakes, but not really very impressive seeming compared to the biggins. But surprise, surprise, this little unassuming group of snakes are the pound for pound kings, get it? In terms of strength. Comparing the strength of boas to pythons, boas, these are not pythons, boas are the undisputed champs. A boa constrictor will outclass any python of a similar size or even substantially bigger. A dumeril's boa will outclass a boa constrictor of a similar size and an anaconda would dwarf a dumeril's boa. But if you were to scale up a king snake to the size of even a ball python, you would have a snake that could generate a PSI. We don't have the math on this. Uh, no, it says check math of how many times is strong on the script I have. Same here. I'll put the number here because I'll do the math. Ta-da! This is pound for pound the strongest snake on the planet. Well, not, you know, this one specifically. I don't know Johanna's workout routine to know how she stacks against other king snakes. I'm just talking about king snakes as a whole. They are the pound for pound strongest. Add to that a high degree of resistance to viper venom. Rattlesnakes are a staple on the menu for many wild king snakes, if you didn't know. King snakes are arguably one of the baddest snakes on the planet, but look how sweet Johanna is. She's great. So we've got snakes that use venom. We have others that use constriction. Are there any that do both? Yes. Australia's brown snake is highly venomous and often constricts their prey while the venom does its job. Pogno snakes are rear fang venomous. Their venom is relatively mild, so added pressure of constriction helps close the deal. False water cobras are often also observed doing both. There are lots of species that use constriction on top of envenomation. Okay, now are there any species that do neither? Well, yeah. At least those that often don't use either. False water cobras, as I mentioned before, that uses both will sometimes just use neither. Or more accurately, they just don't wait until the venom has done anything to subdue the prey before they start eating it. Oftentimes, falsies just grab the prey that they know won't pose much of a threat and just start swallowing it down, counting on their ability to relentlessly overpower their prey by slowly dragging them deeper and deeper into the gaping maw. In this process, they would almost certainly get envenomated, but there is just 
no time for that to do anything and it can't act as anything beyond having a sedentary effect before the prey is down. Garter snakes hunt in the same way, very rarely coiling prey, just getting to work swallowing. Garter snake venom is far milder than that of a false water cobra, so it would have even less effect. Indigo snakes are another great example. They have no venom, so they just gulp it down and go. Tackling bigger prey this way is risky, but if they stick to smaller prey being eaten more often, it is an effective and horrifying strategy. So which method is better? Well, that's like asking if pancakes are better than waffles. Yes, no, maybe. Who knows? It depends on the occasion. Venom versus constriction is a product of millions of years of evolution fine-tuned to work best for a particular species in their particular environment. Basically, it depends on the situation and the species. Venom tends to be ideal for fast, agile predators who need to neutralize prey quickly from a distance. But not always. Constriction, on the other hand, is ideal for ambush predators who rely on strength and stealth but not always. And let's not forget, both methods aren't just about feeding. They're also about self-defense. Venomous snakes can use their bite to deter predators, while constrictors often rely on their size and strength to make would-be attackers think twice. Let's compare them side by side. Venom. The pros. Quick and effective at a distance. Less physical effort to dispatch prey. Lower risk of injury as a quick initial strike is often all that's needed. There is less direct contact with the struggling prey that way. It speeds up digestion as the venom is already pre-digesting it, requiring less energy and fewer physical changes to be required. See that video I mentioned earlier to see what that's all about, eh? Okay, now let's talk about the cons. It requires a biologically expensive, dedicated system to produce. Venom glands can run dry, leaving a snake without a means of defense or hunting. Self-envenomation is a real risk. Most venomous snakes do have a certain degree of resistance to their own venom, but it is still powerful, dangerous stuff. Snakes can get ill or even die from accidentally biting themselves. I think that covers the main points for venom. Now let's look at constriction, the pros. No specialized systems to produce venom are required, obviously. They don't have it. Generally allows for the handling and the submission of larger prey, which means bigger meals. The power and strength required to be a successful constrictor are useful in other aspects of snake life. Being bigger and stronger is generally a good advantage all around. Cons. Requires close, prolonged physical contact. That means the animal that you're trying to eat can bite you. It's physically demanding. A sick or injured constrictor may find themselves unable to subdue prey and get nourishment that they need to heal from said illness or injury. It takes more time, time that leaves the snake exposed to predators. The constrictor will squeeze the prey for several minutes, maybe even hours for big prey. That's a long time to sit exposed in a big ball of just animal. The bigger relative prey constrictors tackle also means it takes longer to swallow, which means even more time being exposed which means even more risk. Which is the best? I don't know, you tell me. So there you have it. Two incredible ways snakes have evolved to hunt and survive. Whether they're injecting venom or squeezing the life out of their prey, these techniques are a testament to the amazing adaptability of snakes. No wonder they're among the most successful group of reptiles scooting around the world today. So what about you? Are you team spicy spit or team squeezy hugs. Let me know in the comments. Thanks for hanging out with me today, and if you enjoyed this video, please do not forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that bell so you know that you will never miss a scaly moment. A special shout out to my amazing patrons for making this all possible. You are the best. If you are interested in supporting me in my quest to share all of the coolest reptile facts, head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl. Thanks to you all for watching, and until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Don't get bitten by anything. Bye!